My favorite Tim right there, man. That was awesome. Amen. You know, he is my cousin. He's my cousin. And uh, he, <laughs> I taught him everything he knows. <laughs> He's so blessed. No, no, he is, <clears throat> he got, him and his brother got the, they're a little bit more musically inclined than my side of the tree. <laughs> but praise the Lord for that. Absolutely. I, I don't know about you. That's why I came to church today is, is for Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you. Uh, may you be glorified. May we encounter your gospel today. Amen. Amen. My subject is not knowing what to ask for. In Matthew 20... 20 through 23, it says that when the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking, my subject. You don't know what to ask for. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. We're on a series called The Christ Encounters, and next Sabbath we'll come to the dramatic conclusion of this series. And, and basically, in a nutshell, it's been all about how when we meet Christ and encounter the gospel, we, we are transformed by the gospel. That, that man, we should be different um, A.D. than we were B.C., People should be able to tell, as in, in the book of Acts, it said of the disciples, they could tell that they had been with Jesus. And the world should be able to tell that we're Christians. And so we've been on this encounter. We've seen all these different ways demons were set free and chains have been broken and people have been healed and people who were bleeding, the, the leaking has been stopped. And I mean, Jesus puts his hand to anything and it's changed. It's changed. And so here we have our next encounter with the mother of the sons of thunder and James and John. Anyone here remember the show Father Knows Best? Raise your hand. You're, you're the old ones of the church. <laughs> I, I remember it only because it was on um, reruns. I didn't see the original. But uh, yeah, so for those of you who have never seen Father Knows Best, of course, it was, it was during kind of the, I believe, late 40s, mostly the 50s, uh, maybe into the first part of the 60s. And it was a show, and, and often the shows during this time, uh, and it had good lessons, it had good stuff in it, it tended to paint a picture of, of a perfect family that was maybe a little bit too perfect, but it was still a good show. They taught some pretty decent lessons. And, and basically, it was, you know, they would run into situations and always kind of at the end, it would be, you know, the father, the wise father would step in and really give just some real good sage advice and, and say something. And so, hence the name, Father Knows Best. Uh, James and John and their mom, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, thinks she knows what's best for her son. And sometimes we think we know what's best, don't we? Parents, you think you know what's best for your kids. Uh, sometimes we think we know what's best for a situation, and, and we know what's best for our lives or best for the, church, tr for the church. But the truth is, often in life, more times than not, we don't know what to ask for. You don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. We don't know what's best. Proverbs 3, the wisest man who ever lived, the wisest man and the dumbest man that ever lived, Solomon. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. He's speaking from, in, uh, from experience here. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Basically, God knows best. You don't know best, but hallelujah, God knows best. 
And the thing is, if we really believe that, if we really believe that God knew best, we wouldn't worry about half the stuff that we worry about. Because most of the stuff you worry about is stuff you can't do anything about. We worry most about the stuff we can't do anything about. I mean, last time I checked, you cannot make that family member get help. I don't care how much you try, you can't make the family member get help. You can't make crazy people reasonable. (laughs) The thing about crazy people is they don't know they're crazy. If you're afraid you might be going crazy, that's a good sign. You're not crazy. It's crazy people think they're normal. You can't make people like you or forgive you if they do not want to. And that's one of the the best prayers I've ever learned to pray is, is, Father, tell me when it's none of my business, which is very often. You know, the best prayer you can ever pray, Lord, uh, tell me when it's none of my business. If I return my tithe like you asked me, then how am I going to pay these bills? It's none of your business. Uh, Lord, if I keep your Sabbath the way you've asked us to keep your Sabbath, uh, then uh, how will I keep my job? That's none of your business. That's my business. Your business is to have faith in me. Lord, how can that person ever be saved? How can my child ever get, get help? How can I ever live the life you've called me to live? And God says, look, praying is your business. Saving is my business. Get out of God's business. There's some of you here today that are all up in God's business. God's telling you today, get out of my business. I'm working in that person's life. As the prophet Habakkuk said, I'm doing a thing in your day you wouldn't believe even if I told you. Basically, after you've done everything you can do, believe that God will do all he can do. And what God can do is far better than anything you could do. Amen. I love 1 Peter 5, 7. We looked at this last week a little bit, didn't we? It, it says, it cast all your anxieties, worries, cast all your worries on him because, check it out, he cares for you. Now, I think it's interesting that it doesn't say hand your worries to him. No, it uses the word cast, okay? It's a word that means Throw. Man, don't just hand your problems to Jesus. Man, throw your problems to Jesus. The second you get them, you got to get rid of them. Throw them. Don't hold on to them. You got to get rid of them. Throw them. The psalmist knew something about problems. And so in Psalms 55, 22, he says, cast your burdens. Your, your uh, same concept, cast your, the weight that's on your heart on the Lord and check this out, he will sustain you. I like the way Eugene Peterson in the message puts this. He says, check it out, pile your troubles on God's shoulders. Because some of us, if we're honest, we don't just have problems. Some of us have piles of problems. For some of us, our problems have problems have problems. So we don't just have problems, we've got piles of, of problems. And, 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 and sometimes we try to put our problems on our parents, but this is the thing, parents' shoulders aren't big enough. Okay? Parents' shoulders aren't big enough. And for years, I would go to my mom. I'd say, Mom, I need you to pray for this because I know she's a prayer warrior. And I'm a still believer, and I still will say, Mom, I need you to pray for this, you know, whatever. Uh, but, but at one time, I will never forget it, and, and I may have shared it with you before, but my mom says, Richie, you, you, I hope you're taking this straight to the Lord and not just coming through me. You see, you can cut out the middle man and go straight to God. Because you see, the reality is your parents' shoulders aren't big enough for all of your problems and their problems. Some of us want to pile our problems on our spouse, but your spouse's shoulders are not big enough for for your problems. Sometimes we want to pile our problems on the pastor, but my shoulders are not big enough for your problems and my problems. Now, I want to hear about what's going on in your life. I want to pray for you. But ultimately, why not take your problems to someone who can actually do something about your problems? His name is Jesus. Take your problems straight to Jesus. 
You don't have to come through a priest to go to God. You can go straight to God. Give your problems to someone who can do something about it. I want to help you in your problems. I just, but all I can really do is connect you to the only one who can really do anything about it. Because we don't know what to ask for. Jesus says, when you pray, don't babble on. Babylon. <laughs> yeah, that's what, I mean, that's what it means. You know, come out of Babylon. It, it's confusion. You don't need to babble on. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think that their prayers are answered merely by repeating it, uh, their words again and again and again. And don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need before you even ask. And so that's powerful, you know, because sometimes we think we need to remind God. You know, hey, God, I prayed this yesterday, and it still hasn't happened, and we remind them every day. We keep repeating it every day, and, and again, we cast our problems on God, and we talk to God about all the things that weigh us down, but stop, you don't have to remind God. He knows what he's doing. You don't know what's best. Hallelujah, God knows what's best. In fact, in, in Romans, check it out, Romans 8.26, it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We don't know what we're asking for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That word groaning means a sigh of deep concern or anxiety. Anybody ever sighed? Some of us started this week with a big sigh. Amen. You showed up at the office, and that person met you at the door. Here we go. You showed up at church, and that person made that comment. Here we go. It's the size of our lives. And, and, and so we all have moments where we let out those sighs and, and, and stress, and sometimes we don't even say it. And that's what's so cool, is according to this text, is we don't even have to say anything. God can take our inarticulate, incoherent sighs in our lives, and, and he can take that, and he translates them into the request we would have prayed for if our faith wasn't so weak. So you just let out kind of an inaudible, oh, you know, Lord, help me. And, and the Holy Spirit takes that and, and translates that into, well, what, really, what Richie really needs right now is da-da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's, that's the God we serve. Man, that's a powerful text. God doesn't even, he knows you don't know best, and so he takes that into consideration when he listens to your ridiculous, puny prayers. And if we really believe this, friends, our prayers would be 90% praise and only 10% petition. But often today, our prayers are 90% petition, 9% um, daydreaming, and 1% praising. Now we'll go through a, a laundry list of petitions and then and, and get to the Bob. Oh, yeah, and thanks, Lord. And you know what, I've discovered something, and I'm telling on myself here, often when you really listen to your petitions, sometimes they're not even petitions. They're, they sound more like directions. Often our petitions are not petitions. You're not asking. You're telling. And that's exactly what happens here. Notice, let me jump back there, Matthew 20, 21. And he said to her, what do you want? She says to him, say that these two sons of mine are, sit, are to sit, one at your right hand and one on your left in the kingdom of God. And then in Mark, it says that, that the sons of thunder, and they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Uh, the word grant and the word say are, are the imperatives, which means they were the command. And so this is what you need to understand. The, the mother of the sons of thunder and the sons of thunder they're not asking Jesus, they're telling Jesus. 
And often in our prayer time, our petitions are really directions. Lord, I'm going to need you to take care of this, and then if you could work that out, and then if you could deal with that person, and then if you could open this door, and if you could bless this financial uh, uh, endeavor, and if you could resolve that problem, and then do this, man, that is a grocery list. That's not a prayer list. And what really blows your mind when you look at this story is when you study the context of what happens right before it. It's mind-boggling. When when you study what happens directly before they make this request. Okay, let's check it out. Notice it says, Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he says to them, See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and they will deliver him uh, over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. Now watch this, the very next verse. He's just told them what he's going to do for them. And notice, continuing, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, him she asks him for something say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one on your left in the kingdom Jesus has just said I'm going to be mocked humiliated flogged and crucified and before the words are even out of his mouth here comes the mother of the sons of thunder excuse me Jesus excuse me Jesus I I need you to do something for me How dare you? (laughs) The English Standard Version, which is one of my favorite translations because it's the most, one of the more literal texts. It's gone back to that Greek and it's really tried to be exactly as much as it can with what the original Greek says. So I love the English Standard Version here. It says she kneeled before him, but I have to admit, I like what the King James Version says here a little bit more. In Matthew 20, 20, it says that she worshiped him. That's powerful. And, And that's what the kneeling is implying. She's getting down on her knees. She's worshiping. The mother of the sons of thunder is worshiping, but check this out. She's worshiping with an agenda. Are you here worshiping with an agenda? Sadly, very often we worship, but it's with an agenda. And that's why Jesus cuts to the chase and he just goes, you know, hey, you're not distracting me by this worship. What do you want? You know, when, when we show up, I don't care. He, God sees through the happy Sabbath. God sees through all that stuff and the way, you know, with our, our Sabbath best and all that. I mean, it's great, but God sees through that straight to your heart, and he knows why you are here. He knows whether it's for you or for yourself. And so Jesus is asking everybody, before you come in the door, on your ride to work, he's sitting there and he's wondering, and he's asking you the same thing. When you're going to the dope house, he's, he's asking you the same thing. When you go to work and you're, you're working yourself into an early grave, he's asking you the same thing. Basically, Jesus wants, what do you want? Why are you in the church? Why do you pray? Why are you a Christian? What do you really want from worship? Because you can look like you're worshiping God while actually worshiping yourself. And we could fool everyone here, but we will never fool God. Do you give up on God the moment things don't go your way? You know, did you ask God to do something for you, and he didn't show up the way you prayed him to show up? And so do you give up if that happens? If so, then you were never really here for God. You were here for what you wanted from God. And because you didn't get what you wanted from God, you're now deserting God. If you give up on the marriage, and don't get me wrong, I, I know that, that some of our marriages have come to an end, um, uh, that, you know, uh, that, that's what needed to happen. I understand this, but, but, but I think sometimes people in this day and age are too quick to give up on the marriage. And if we give up on the marriage because we don't get what we want, then you were never really in this for the marriage. You were in it for what you wanted from the marriage. Mark doesn't even mention the mom. When you read Mark's account, you know, Mark's always in a hurry. His gospel is is quicker than, you know, it's like by by the, I mean, the first quarter of the book, and he's it's already into the final week. It's Mark's in a hurry, so he doesn't even mention the mom's request. 
And the reason why he doesn't mention the mom, most believe, it's because it was the son's idea anyway. And so they just cut the mom out because, hey, they were just doing that for her sons anyway. So, so that's what Mark's zoning in on. That's his perspective that the Holy Spirit's given him. He doesn't include the mother because it was James and John who put her up to it. Check it out. They're using their mother to get what they want. And too often, friends, we love people not for who they are but for what they do for us. But friends, that's not love. That's using someone in order to love yourself. That's not love. Loving people who, you know, Jesus says, look, even the the non-believers do that. Even unbelievers love people who love them. There's a rule. I mean, that's just therapeutic. I love you. You love me. I make you laugh. You make me laugh. I mean, you're getting some out of the, you're getting something out of the agreement. That's not love. Matthew 20, 24, it says, and when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. We don't really use that word indignant, but basically it means they were really mad. They're really mad. Now, they're not really mad because they're like, man, that's just really rude. They're not mad because, man, that's that doesn't sound right. That's not what we should do as loving people. We, Jesus says we came to serve and not to be served. That, that's not what they're thinking. Listen to me. The other 10 are upset just because James and John beat them to it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was Bartholomew. You never hear anything about Bartholomew. Maybe that was Bartholomew's idea. And James and John, they're like, yeah, that's good. In fact, let's get mom involved and we'll go to Jesus. They're indignant, they're mad, they're angry. How do I know they weren't upset because their morals were offended? Because you read in Luke 22, 24, they all began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. They all wanted to be at the right and the left of Jesus. They all wanted to be closest to Jesus and maybe they wanted even a little bit more. They all wanted to know what Jesus would do for them. They all wanted Jesus to do something for them. And often we come to church, and we come for church for one reason. We want Jesus to do something for us. We showed up because maybe we got a warrant for our arrest. I better get back to church. We get audited by the IRS. I better get back to church. You know, my, my spouse left me. I better get back to church. We go to church because with the same reason, what are you going to do for us? Man, get to church because your sorry, sick soul needs church. Amen. What's crazy, what really gets me about this is the, the, the disciples and the sons of thunder are acting, and the mother, are acting like they're not already blessed. You hear what I'm saying? They're acting like they're not already blessed. I want, I want you to think about this. The Bible tells us that the Zebedees own their own family business. They own their own fishing boats. Uh, let, me, let me tell you, the Zebedees are already blessed. James and John still have both their parents, and for those of us who've lost a parent, we know that's rough. James and John still have both their parents. Let me tell you, they're already blessed. In Mark 3, 13, check this out. It says, then Jesus went up to a hill and he called to himself the men he wanted. Jesus wanted them. He chose 12. They were chosen whom he named apostles. I have chosen you to be with me. I will give you authority to drive out demons. Check it out. They were already blessed. Jesus took James and John wherever he went. They are not just the disciples. They are inner circle. All right, so when, when, when Jesus goes in to heal, to resurrect the, the daughter of Jairus, he only takes in Peter, James, and John, their inner circle. They're already blessed. When he goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration so that they can see him in, in his unadulterated glory, he only takes Peter, James, and John. They were already blessed. Friends, if you have a Bible, if you have a church, if you live in this country, if you have a roof over your head, if you are breathing today, you are already blessed. We never learn this mother's name. 
She's just known as the mother of the Zebedee boys. Her whole identity is wrapped up in her kids. Sounds like a few parents I know. I mean, if we're honest, sometimes, I mean, and, 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 and it's that way for a reason, but sometimes our lives seem to revolve, can revolve around our kids. Take them to school, take them back, we work so we can put, give them a good education, do this, and we take them to the ball games, then we go from the ball games, we go here, we go that, feed them, dress them, then, you know, and, and it feels that way sometimes, you know? And this is why sometimes some parents lose it when their kids grow up and move out of the house, because their whole identity was wrapped up in their kids, and once their kids are gone, they look at their spouse and they're like, well, now what do we do? <laughs> and that's why there is an order of this, friends. First, you've got to develop your relationship with God. That's got to be number one. Second, you've got to develop your relationship with your marriage. And then third, you've got to take care of those kids. But too many of us have put the kids before the relationship, and that's why often things can split up afterwards. Uh, we, we've wrapped our identity. Sometimes we wrap up so much of our identity in our kids that when they leave, we just don't know who we are anymore. But listen to me today. Before you were a mother, before you were a father, before you were a husband, before you were a wife, before you were a doctor, a plumber, a mechanic, a, a dentist, a lawyer, before any of that, listen to me, you were a child of God. Which means... We can have no kids, we can have no job, we can have no spouse, we can have no flowers, we can have no cards, we can have no respect, we can have no money, and we can still be loved beyond our wildest dreams. I want you to say this with me. I am already blessed. Just before this, in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, they're already blessed. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on... <laughs> Check it out. This is right before what Je This is right before they ask for a throne. They're asking for something they already have. Church, look, if you've accepted Christ, you already have salvation. You already have forgiveness. You already have redemption. Stop asking for stuff you already have. You're already a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're already ready for Jesus to come. Stop asking for something that you already have in Christ Jesus. You see, it's sad, but it seems as though having a throne wasn't enough for the sons of Zebedee and the mom. Apparently, a throne wasn't enough. They wanted a throne closest to Jesus. I find it interesting that we read in Ezekiel 28, 14, it says that Satan, who was an angel before he fell, was the anointed cherub of covering, who covers that's really cool when you start to analyze. Well, what does that mean? He's the, he's the cherub that covers. Well, we, we get an idea in, the, uh, in, in the, 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 the tabernacle on earth, which was, a pro, which, was, was, which was made after the prototype in heaven. And so here it says, the cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat. The mercy seat was the throne of God. And with their wings, their faces one to another, towards the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. There I will meet with you from above the mercy seat and between the two cherubim that are on the ark. There was one on the left and there was a one on the right of God. The covering cherub was the closest you could get to the throne of God without being God. Lucifer was already blessed. It says that he was on the holy mountain of God. Lucifer was already blessed. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. He was already blessed. The Bible said you were perfect. Lucifer was already blessed. But guess what? Perfect wasn't enough for Lucifer. And that is what sin does to your life. Let me tell you, and I struggle with this, perfectionism 
It, it is a result of sin. It is, a, it is a desire to continue to earn your worth from your peers, from your God, from everything. You push yourself, push yourself, push yourself because you just got to get better to show that you deserve heaven. But let me tell you, you can never, ever do enough to deserve heaven. And if you would focus instead on the perfection of Christ, instead of trying to become perfect, man, you would see so much more miracles in your life. And so Lucifer, these people aren't satisfied. It wasn't enough for them to have thrones. They wanted thrones right next to Jesus. But Lucifer, he had a throne right next to Jesus, and it wasn't enough for him. Have you noticed some people, it doesn't matter, they're never satisfied. You know anybody like that in your life? Lord, I need you to do something for me. You know, mother or sons of the... Lord, I need you to do something. James and John, Lord, I, I need you to do something for me. Did you not hear me? I just said I was going to give my life for you. You know what the root of sin is? It's selfishness. And I don't care who you are or how good you think you are. If you're breathing, you're selfish. Selfish is the root of sin. Jesus wants to save people, and we want to know how it's going to affect our schedule. That's selfish. Nominating committee is going to be rolling around before too long. That's always an exciting time. <laughs> First question you get. Um, tell me what it entails, and how long do I got to do it? <laughs> Oh. Jesus wants us to grow the kingdom of God in this Cleveland area and surrounding areas. Jesus wants the, us to plant churches and do evangelism. And our first question is, yeah, well, how will that affect us? We're selfish. Sin has messed us up. But, but while James and John are worried, this is what I love about our God, while James and John are worried about position, Jesus is still working out their salvation. <laughs> while they're worried about gaining possession, uh, position within the church, Jesus is still using, is still moving things so that he can save them. And sometimes, you know what? We, we posture for position in the church. Hallelujah. God loves you. And in spite of you doing that, he's still going to save you. Amen. James and John and their mom are not bad people. These people are disciples, they're apostles. John, according to John, is the one whom Jesus loved most. <laughs> James, John, and their mom were not bad people. In fact, the Bible tells us of the mother of the sons of thunder, notice, there was, this has only been written by so many, uh, about so many people. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and check it out, the mother of the sons of Zebedee. She followed Jesus. She ministered to Jesus. In fact, we just read she worshiped Jesus. She, she was not a bad person. It's just that parents, I mean, they just want what's, what, what, what we think is best for our kids. I mean, that's normal to want what's best for the people we love. That is normal. Just remember that the position you want from your, for your kid has a price. And I don't care who you are, you, it, it, you, can't, you cannot earn until you learn how to work. Parents, your kids aren't ever going to, they're never going to learn until you let them learn how to work. You can't lead until you first learn how to serve. Amen. That young person will not heal in your life until you let them hit the bottom. You rescuing them every time they get into trouble is killing them. Amen. If you want them to grow up, get out of the way. As parents, we have a hard time getting out of the way. But this is the reality, this is the spiritual principle that we all need to understand. And that is, for those, only those who die with Jesus get to live with Jesus. Only those who endure pain with Jesus get to reign with Jesus, which means death and pain and hardship are in the cards for us. 
And you can't take the pain from your children. They've got to walk through that painful crucible themselves. Only those who die with them get to rise with them. Matthew 20, 20, 22 says, you do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And check out what these dummies say. <laughs> we are able. <laughs> that statement is proof that they still don't get it, and often neither do we. You see, they're so focused on where they want to sit, they don't see the cup they've got to drink in order to sit there. And so finally Jesus says, okay, you ask for the cup, you will get the cup. Yeah, you wanted to be a Christian, now drink the cup. What are you crying about? You wanted to be, you wanted to be, you wanted to have the leadership position, now you got to drink the cup. You wanted to be used, drink the cup. You wanted to be saved, drink the cup. You wanted to be in charge, this is what being in charge looks like, drink the cup. You wanted to get married, drink the cup. You can't have Christianity without the cup. Amen. Ephesians says that uh, God raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Check it out. Before Jesus was ever raised up, he first had to die. Before you can ever lead, you have to die. You see, Christianity is not about doing. Christianity is about dying. But we want, we want the promise without the problems. We want the salvation without the sacrifice. We want recognition without obligation. We want wealth without the work. We want fame without the pain. We want heaven, but without the cross. We want to sit in the seat without having to drink the cup. But you're going to drink that cup. Jeremiah 25, 15, what is the cup? Well, Jeremiah calls it the cup of God's wrath. Isaiah calls it the cup of staggering. What is this cup? Well, the cup in its simplicity represents the justice of God. Basically, all the pain from sin, it's called the, the cup of wrath of God, all the pain from sin, all God's anger against sin, every premature death, every overdose, every bad decision, all the selfish motivation, all the rebellion of broken world bent on destruction is poured out into this metaphorical proverbial cup, and someone's got to drink it. And Luke says, I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me. And I am under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. Father, it, gee, the cup was so full of the wrath that Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. You see, someone has to drink the cup. And the good news for our hearts today is Jesus drank your cup. In Isaiah, it says that out of the anguish of his soul on the cross, out of the anguish, he was in utter anguish of his soul. He shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Because what you don't seem to understand is that before I can be coronated in heaven, I must first be coronated with a crown of thorns. What you don't understand that in my glory, that, that my throne will be a cross, that the place at my left and right is already taken by a couple of crooks. Can you imagine the thought that G James and John and the sons and the mother of Zebedee must have thought when they see two crooks in the place that they wanted their sons to sit. You want the cross? This is what it looks like. Instead of giving you what you deserve, God is so good that he's giving you grace instead. Amen. You see, friends, Jesus drank the cup that you can't handle so that through him you can handle anything. Jesus drank the cup of your staggering as he staggered under the cross so that in his grace, Paul says, you can stand and not stagger rejoicing with the hope and the glory of God. Luke 22, 20, the cup that is poured out for you is my blood. For you to drink the cup, Jesus had to die. 
But Jesus drank the ultimate cup outside of Jerusalem. Rotten wine, vinegar on a hyssop branch, so that one day you can drink the fresh fruit of the vine inside the new Jerusalem. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will con condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. But hallelujah, this text doesn't stop there. It doesn't end with bad news. It continues, and he will be raised up on the third day. You see, friends, if you stick with Jesus, no matter how rough life gets, on the other side of every crucifixion is a resurrection. On the other side of this crucible, God's going to raise you up. Ephesians tells us, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Now check this out. And raised us up with him and has seated us. Check it out. What did James, John, and the mother of the sons of thunder want? They wanted a seat. They wanted a throne. Raised them up in a seat with him in the heavenly places of Jesus Christ. Christ eventually gave James and John and their mother what they asked for. And one day soon, let me tell you, everything that is wrong with this world will become radically untrue. And Jesus is going to give you everything that your heart really yearned for, which isn't the new car, it's not the bigger bank, it's not the better looks, it's not the better body. He's going to give you a, 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 a better experience of encountering the risen king. It's the true and better resurrection, Paul says to the Hebrews. So even though you don't know what you're asking, you can leave here happy and confident because even though you don't know what you to ask for, Jesus knows what he's doing in your life. And he will not be sidetracked by your stupidity. He will not let you shoot yourself in the foot. Jesus loves you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the awesome God that you are. We thank you that instead of listening to us when we, we were wanting to settle for something, you, you, you held out and you gave us the best that we could ever receive. Help us to see that our own heart often condemns us, that we don't know what we need. We don't know what's best. And Sometimes as parents, we think we know what's best for our children, and we do the best we can, but ultimately, we've got to recognize we don't know what's best, only you know what's best. In the church, we often think that we know what's best, but Lord, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm telling on myself, I don't know what's best, but I know I serve a God who knows best. And so, Lord, I just pray that, that we would leave here knowing that even though we don't know what we're asking, hallelujah, you know what you're doing Put your hand to our life. Lord, I pray for transformation. I pray we will leave here because we've encountered your gospel as new creations in Christ. That we will not be the same people that we walked in the door. That when you ask us, what do you want? We will simply say, we want you, Lord. We want you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.